friends, one cup at a time. Yeah, this is tea time. Make a difference, one cup at a time. So be sure to grab your tea, grab a seat, and tune in to Miss Liz. Well, welcome to Tea Time. That's right, Miss Liz is back. And you know what time that is. It is time to do storytelling and words. That's right. We don't serve a beverage on Tea Time. We serve real life stories and words with the TEA, Teaching Educational Awareness. But today I have the incredible Jeff Rosley back. He's going to be back for the third time. That's right. He loves Tea Time so much that he's come back for the third time. And we were just talking in the background and we always seem to find each other when a time needs to be picking up because sometimes you just need that pick up, right? So before we get started, we're going to get you guys over to Miss Liz's YouTube channel. We're going to get you to ring that little doorbell so that you can listen to all these tea times in the morning, afternoon, evening, whenever you feel like it. Or you can join us during the live streams and ask your questions and share your support. Uh, what does Miss Liz offer you? Well, I offer you over 300 plus tea times with different guests from around the globe with over 105 different topics. So there's something there for everybody. If one tea doesn't resonate with you, the next one will, I guarantee you that. So now a little bit on how tea time works. Well, we do a disclaimer. And the reason we do a disclaimer on tea time is because you just never know. Sometimes things happen in life and we need those backups and support to watch over us. And then I'm going to give you a bio on Jeff and then I'm going to get Jeff in here. And we're going to be serving you a tea of tasteful, energetic and alive. And I think today is a perfect time to talk about those three words, uh, deeply important. So grab your tea, grab your coffee, grab your juice, grab whatever you'd like. You do not have to drink tea to listen to Tea Time with Miss Liz. So let's get started with the disclaimer. Disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time live show. Miss Liz, myself, is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought for you forward for any tea time show hosted by myself miss liz is always brought forward in good faith however may bring forth dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform the facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing all tea time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment and taking any action that may relate to the discussion the content brought forward may include discussions for some where they may be emotionally at risk it's significant to know that this show is engaging in discussion forums only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Miss Liz, through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in today's show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that the show is not made for you at this time, I respect your wishes and we'll see you at a later show at a later date and time. And again, all regular tea time shows are done on Thursday, 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you see it on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it's a special surprise or a rescheduled tea time. Miss Liz has tea all the time for you guys. So now a little bit about my guest. Well, Jeff Rosley is residing on the White River in Indianapolis. I think I'm saying it right. With Alice and Poppy is an accomplished writer with over 80 featured articles and 14 books. His adventurous spirit took him from hike, hitchhiking across the USA to leading the Himalayan treads. A committed social activist, he co-founded the Goshen Walk for Hunger, fought for renters' rights, and led efforts for in, environmental cleanup. Jeff founded the Baza Village Foundation, promoting development in Nepal, and is active in various nonprofits. He holds a BA from the University of Chicago and a JD from Indi Indian Indiana University, and on MD IV from Christian Te Theological Seminary. For Jeff, reading Pross is an adventurous and his Himalayan climbs. Let's get Jeff in here and let's spill some tea together. And I'm going to take a sip of my tea because I am drinking tea, tea today. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you, Liz. Good to be with you again. You know, the opening of Tea Time always has me rambling. I feel like I'm rambling because uh, I have to <laughs> put so much out there, right? Uh, 
<laughs> so welcome back, Jeff. Thanks. Good to see you again. So, Jeff, for people who haven't seen you on Tea Time on season three and four, share a little bit about who you are and what you offer to everybody out there. Oh, thanks. Well, uh, I mean, you cover a lot of it. I grew up in a small town in northern Indiana called Goshen. And um, when I uh, turned 18 and after being strong armed and going to trying out college for at least a semester, uh, because my parents said they would shoot me if I didn't at least give it a try. I dropped out, um, worked in a factory for six weeks, uh, saved up a little bit of money and hitchhiked across the country from northern Indiana uh, all the way down to the southernmost point in the U.S., Key West then hitchhiked over to New Orleans uh, to experience Mardi Gras and back home. And that was just the first of many uh, travel adventures, which have uh, I've been to, I stopped counting after I hit 45 countries and 49 states in the U.S. and almost all the provinces in Canada. Oh. Um, so, uh, yeah, travel has been a big part of my life um, and was kind of the, the, the heart of uh, that last book that I wrote. But it is uh, what we call auto fiction, meaning it's based on a true, real experience, but it's also fictionalized. So, um, yeah, and I am still happily married uh, to Alicia after many, many years. And uh, both of our sons are grown. And we have our cat, Poppy, who lives with us here on the White River in Indianapolis. I I, I was I couldn't remember if Poppy was a cat or a dog. And I'm glad that you had said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's she she she's the the kind of little creature that has those sharp claws, which uh, uh, the last dog we had at least did not have sharp claws. Which that there is an advantage uh, for dog owners in that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take my listeners on a little travel because you've traveled so much. So we're gonna travel together today. Uh, when you first came to me on uh, for tea time, you had been told by your wife at the time i think to take a hike but you had really taken a hike when you came you had climbed the mountains in uh, nepal and that do you want to share a little bit about that jeff yeah well um you know that was quite a while ago now um but uh when i turned 40 i was manifesting midlife crisis symptoms and uh was kind of ridiculous but i guess this is what goes with that syndrome because life was great i was the senior partner in a boutique law firm that was doing very well and was a very involved dad and you know it's like you looked at the surface and life couldn't have been better but there was just this kind of gnawing um discomfort and dissatisfaction and my wife um <laughs> It was unfortunately, you know, sort of, you know, victim is a little too strong, but, you know, saw it. And um, so one day I came home from the office and she slapped a brochure down on the coffee table in front of me and said, why don't you go do this? And it was to join a trekking group in Nepal and uh, trek to Mount Everest. So I did. Uh, and I fell in love with the Himalayan mountains and with the people that live up in the high country there and ended up going back uh, 13 more times, um, eventually uh, becoming a, a trekking and mountaineering leader. I went through you know, training to learn how to climb properly and uh, organized many groups, um, started a foundation uh, called the Basa Village Foundation, which you mentioned, and we do what we call culturally sensitive development group in this uh, remote area of Nepal called Basa. Uh, and it just, uh, you know, became a very big part of my life. Um, and it still is, I'm still the president of the foundation. But uh, unfortunately, um, 
age and a hip replacement have um, caught up with me. So my really hard trekking and climbing days are probably behind me. Um, so I haven't been back to Nepal for several years. But, uh, you know, we have somebody from our foundation go each year. And so we keep in, you know, personal contra contact and now with Zoom and, you know, the Internet, which has reached even the from all almost all the remote areas of Nepal, we stay in touch with our local contacts as well. So long answer to your to, to your question. No, that's OK. And then when you were on last year for season two, you had come on for 72 Wisdoms, your book. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Wisdoms. So how, right. how's that book going for you? Well, I, I mean, no book that I've written has ever sold as many copies as I wish that they would. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, a couple thousand people bought the book and it was intended to uh, offer not just the wisdom that I have gained um, through my life, but the wisdom that 72 other interesting people uh, have offered. So each chapter, and there's 72 chapters, um, relatively short chapters, but each chapter starts with a wisdom saying from some person who I think had something to offer. And then I critique the underlying wisdom, provide the history about that person and why it was said, what the context was, um, which then leads to the next one. So it's kind of a stepping stone um, book. Um, and, uh, you know, so it brings in a lot of different uh, perspectives on a lot of different topics, but what I consider kind of a holistic uh, approach to how to live a good life in a in a wise way well and it is stepping stones right because the next book that you reached out to me for is a uh, hitchhiker's big adventure and that's what your life has been jeff it's been a big adventure since in the three years that i've known you it's been an adventure just getting to know you as well well thanks i you know i decided at a fairly young age um that I wanted my life to, in a way, sort of reflect two things. Um, one is uh, to be adventure, adventurous, to live adventurous. And in that sense, yeah, I mean it like approaching life uh, like it's a work of art, you know, not just go out and recklessly do crazy things and have a bucket list of all the, you know, wild uh things that you could imagine doing that would be adrenaline highs that isn't what i mean i mean building a life that's you know that's a beautiful thing and then secondly living responsibly uh if you have the ability to give back to your community and to the world and uh at an early age that was ingrained in me i mean i grew up uh in a church in a family, in a community that was very close knit and where people looked out for each other. And, you know, even though I live in a big city now and I lived in Chicago for a while, I lived in London for a while where there's, that's, you know, kind of hard uh, to have a, a real sense of the community like you do in a small town. Um, but there's, you know, so many ways that people who have some gifts um, and means to give back. And so that's also been, a, you know, a strong influence and intention in my life also from a young age. So how did you get the title for the last book that you reached out to me for? Uh, Hitchhiker's Big Adventure. Yeah. yeah. How did you get well, that? Um, I thought when, when I, so like I said, when I was, 18, I dropped out of college after one semester. I wanted to have a big adventure because life was like I'd been going to school all my life and I played sports and I worked. And it's like every hour of every day, it seemed like 
uh, so much of it, I was doing things that other people told me I had to do, you know, teachers, parents, uh, ministers, bosses. Um, and so I wanted to just go out on my own, be as free as I could be. Um, and I just, it, you know, just struck me while well, I live in, uh, you know, pretty far north. Uh, and, and this was in um, February when I left. It was very cold. And I thought, I want to go someplace warm. Let's look at the map. Oh, Key West. That's the furthest place away going south. So that's going to be my destination. So I, you know, took, I had saved up a whole $65. Um, my mom drove me out to the edge of town and with tears in her eyes said goodbye. And I stuck my thumb out and started off on this big adventure. Now, but I have to say, um, the like I said, the book is not a tra a factual travel log of everything I experienced. Most of the characters in the book are based on characters I met. All the places in the book where the main character, which seems a lot like me, uh, although I give him the name Jack, were places that I experienced. Um, and most of the experiences in the book were things that I experienced. But I, you know, it was so long ago, I, <laughs> I I couldn't remember everything. I didn't keep a journal. I didn't take a camera. We didn't have cell phones back then because I just wanted to live it. You know, so yeah. I wasn't interested in recording it in any way, just live it. So, you know, trying to remember it, I decided I can't do that. So I'm going to base a story and just tell a story based on that experience. So that's what the book is. Were you ever scared when you were hitchhiking, Jeff? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I a couple of times got into um, uh, a car where a guy had his hand on a gun. Um, you know, he's kind of leaning over. And as I get in, I see he's got his hand kind of down uh un, not exactly under the seat but just in front of the seat and then i see well it's because he's got a gun in his hand and he proceeded to be a really interesting guy um he was a an alligator hunter in oh. florida and he had a gun on the gun rack in his pickup truck and he taught me all about alligator hunting um as we drove across uh uh, alligator alley at the very southern end of florida and um uh i got <laughs> sort of tricked into going to a what a children of god cult uh, a commune which was more like a prison oh. than the kind of commune that i thought it was going to be um got tricked into it by these two pretty girls who approached me and said well, catch you every time <laughs> yeah you know and they they say i want to come home with us that's a hard thing to say no to when you're 18 and especially yeah. when they say our home is a commune and i i had to sneak out uh under cover of darkness to get away from it so yeah and there was a time when i spent the night in a flop house um in atlanta georgia and this very scary um gay guy uh was threatening to break in oh. and uh you know do things that i had no desire to do so that you know i had to show him that i had a weapon um because i took a buck knife with me um and you know so there were a few events like that but in reality in terms of actual physical harm i didn't suffer any um and i met people there is no way i, I would have ever met in goshen indiana so it it really fulfilled the desire i had to have this great adventure and it, it just turned me on to you know to keep traveling and do it in a way where i would meet local people and have experiences much different than the ordinary ones that in the life i was living at home 
Yeah, your book, the book cover, uh, The Hitchhiker, reminded me of my uncle. I had an uncle that hitchhiked every summer. He would hitchhike from Manitoba to Capscasin to go see my grandparents. And he would have the stories of incredible people that he met along the way, uh, you know. Uh, and he was one of those tobacco-chewing guys that would spit in a can. So, so when I seen the cover of your book, I was like, God, that reminds me so much of my Uncle Kenny. Uh, you know, uh, my cousins are listening. Uh, you know, they'd be like, uh, yeah, that was my dad. <laughs> Every summer, that's what he would do, travel from Manitoba to uh, Caps Casing. And he always made it there and made it back home. Uh, but he always had good stories to tell along the way as well. It, you know the you nobody hitchhikes today like they did back in uh oh i mean before i did in the 60s but when i was hitchhiking in the 70s um we're all so paranoid and afraid of other people but back then when there was this kind of hippie peace love consciousness yeah um it, it i mean it, I there wasn't this sense of oh my god the stranger is someone you should be scared of there was yeah. much more a sense of ah stranger cool uh let's get to know each other right so, let's have that adventure together like have yeah. some conversations you know you got to learn about alligators <laughs> that's right which there aren't a lot of in Indiana <laughs> So what did it teach you about yourself as a hitchhiker? Well, I think it gave me um, probably more self-confidence than I had before that. Uh, I mean, just that I could survive it, that I could cope with getting in the car of a complete stranger whose life was very different from mine. Um, and you know, get to know that person and have that person get to know me and just, you know, just live through a, a very different experience. Something like, I mean, I had hitchhiked a little bit. Um, I had hitchhiked a couple times from my house over to Lake Michigan, which is, um, you know, 100, 130 miles away, something like that, and camped out and, and hitchhiked once down um to indiana university uh to hang out with some friends of mine but you know nothing nothing like this uh, so yeah um i think you know self-confidence and just this sense that i know how to survive I, I know how to adapt i mean i think one sort of definition of intelligence is adaptability you know, being able to go into a situation and figure out how to not just survive it, but to um, engage with it successfully. And, you know, I did that. And so, and, you know, motorcycling across North America uh, the next year, hitchhiking across Europe, um, scuba diving throughout the Caribbean, solo sea kayaking in the pacific climbing and trekking in the himalayas all of that just you know it was again these were all just big adventures as opposed to frightening you know scary experiences well i think it goes to your word because i asked you give me one word to describe yourself jeff and you gave me curious and that's what i i hear with all this adventure right is you were curious you wanted to go out and just try it uh so, so when you hear the word curious is that what you think of is all the adventures you've had in life yeah uh, and i mean also i think that it's uh being curious is an attribute that is is a good thing beyond just doing big adventures i think if to learn you need to have a curious mind uh to engage with other people even you know people that you're around every day uh if you're not curious about them um you know your relationships are going to get pretty stale so uh you know having curiosity about the world and about other people i think is important and i mean i think it maybe just came natural to me 
I, I can probably give more credit to my parents than to myself for it because uh, they definitely encouraged me to you know to learn and experience and I think when I went off hitchhiking, my mother especially <laughs> probably wished that she hadn't encouraged that so much, but, uh, you know, too late. Has there ever been any time when your mom has said, oh, I shouldn't have said go down that road? Oh, she <laughs> as many times said that uh, all of her gray hairs are due to me, uh, <laughs> that you know, she even, I mean, you know, now uh, I do things that make her worry. So I don't tell her everything uh, that's going on in my life. Um, but uh, yeah, she's, she's, a, she's, she's a wonderful mother, but yeah, she's also a bit of a worrier. So, so Jeff, let's get into your tea. You, you gave me some incredible words to with your tea today: tasteful, energetic, and alive. So let's talk about those three words. Okay, okay. So, and I think if I was just asked for for three words, I might not have chosen those. But since you stuck me, as you have three times <laughs> now. <laughs> with ones that start with T E and A. Great. Uh, Every time you come, you give me a different tea. Yeah, I have to come up with something. So, you know, tasteful, I I mean, that's a that's a good thing to be. Ta I mean, to me, tasteful means that um, you have taken the time to try to develop uh, a sense of what's good, you know, not just what tastes good in your mouth, but what is good in your life. Um, and energetic, you know, I mean, you got you got to have energy to live fully, to live a good, productive life. Um, so that's, you know, I think that's fairly self-evident. Um, then awareness. Uh, you know, you, you need to be aware of your environment, and especially if you're doing things that are different that you're not used to. And... And Liz, can you hear a kind of knocking in the background? Because there's a woodpecker. Uh, no. Nope. Okay. A woodpecker is <laughs> pecking on the side of my house, right, at, right outside my window, who's like drumming along with us. Oh, there. well, he wanted okay. to get into the stream. I, I know I don't yeah. hear it, but. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was kind of funny. Just, just after he last, asked that last question, he just started pecking away. <laughs> Like well, he he's wanted to be aware, for right? He wanted us aware that he was here. <laughs> That's yes, I yeah. Do you get a lot of woodpeckers at your house? Yes, we do, uh, and I have tried all sorts of different ways to convince them that they should stick to the trees and not my house, but so far none have been very successful. Do you have a wooden house? Is that why they're pecking on your house? Yeah, it's a it's a wood frame house. Yeah, yeah. So you got the good wood. They want the good wood. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. It's very tasteful wood, apparently, <laughs> at least to woodpeckers. So, Jeff, I want to get into pickleball because you're the one that got me talking about pickleball uh, when you came on on season three. And I was like, what the heck is pickleball? I know what it is now, guys. But when Jeff first came to me about pickleball, I was like, what the heck is that? So let's talk about pickleball for the listeners out there who might not know what pickleball is. Okay, so it's a game that's sort of a combination or something in between tennis and table tennis or ping pong. It's on a smaller court than tennis, but it's like a tennis court. There's a lot of the rules of tennis, um, and it but it uses small paddles like uh, ping pong paddles, except they're a little bigger. And it uses a ball that's like a whiffle ball uh, instead of a ping pong or a tennis ball. So, um, and you whack it back and forth. Uh, and it has some weird terminologies, like there's an area up by the net called the kitchen that you're not supposed to st step into when you hit the ball, except uh, unless the ball has bounced in the kitchen first, then you can step into it to hit it. And so there's 
you know, these kind of odd little rules that are different than tennis. But otherwise, it's pretty much like tennis, just with this different uh, paddle and ball and smaller court. I, we never talked about the kitchen. This is the first time I'm talking about the kitchen with the pickle. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's you, you got to stay out of the kitchen. That's one of the lessons. <laughs> and, and, and my wife is usually happy that I stay out of, the, of our kitchen. So, so you're not in the kitchen very often, Jeff? Uh, I am definitely not a cook. I'm happy to eat my wife's, <laughs> enjoy my wife's wonderful cooking. Uh, and I try to carry that over to my pickleball game. You know, when I first heard the pickleball, if you guys go back and watch season three of me and Jeff's conversation, I was a blonde on steroids, did not understand what pickleball was. I thought it was like a ball that looked like a pickle. I did not understand it at all. I actually reached out to the pickleball club here in Cornwall and found out that I could not join until I was at least 50. So it is for, for seniors as well, right, Jeff? Well, it, it's not, I mean, around here, younger people do play, but it's, you know, like statistically far more older people are into it. And most of the people I play with are former tennis players. I, I was a very competitive tennis player for a long time, um, even made it to a, an age group national championship uh, at one point. Um, and so tennis players, racquetball players, uh, table tennis players tend to gravitate towards it. Um, so it's it's some of the people I play with are mostly aged athletes who this is like, OK, this is our last one <laughs> after pickleball. It's tiddly. <laughs> We're <wings>. done. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, Jeff, I want to talk about the STEM, uh, the educational system. Uh, are you part of the boards of directors for that? Yeah, I'm actually the president of the board of uh a foundation called Scientech Foundation of Indiana. And uh, it's really, it's a wonderful uh, organization. It's affiliated with a club called the Scientech Club, which uh, we had our, I was the president of the club when we had our centennial um, anniversary in uh, 2017. So it's now 107 years old. Um, and it's, it meets every Monday and we have an educational program. It's made up mostly of retired people, um, mostly retired professionals like, uh, doctors, lawyers, engineers, but all sorts of people from all sorts of other careers. And we have an educational program every week. And then the, the club created the foundation and the foundation gives away about two hundred thousand dollars every year to um, educational programs around Indiana. Um, and there, for a long, long time, it it had to be a program that supported uh, STEM, science, technology, engineering, or medicine. But we've added the A, so STEAM, to include art uh, in it. So long as the art is has a technological aspect to it. So, for example, we bought um, laser printers and 3D printers for the Indianapolis um, Art Center here in Indy. Um, but most most of our money uh, is given in grants to um, summer camps for kids that are summer science camps. Um, engineering camps, um, medical camps. Those, that's sort of our main focus is to support um, summer camps. But we've bought a lot of equipment for classrooms, um, funded um, internships, things like that. So how do you feel about the science, uh, scientific uh, education system in today's world? Well, I I think it can be too narrow. Uh, and I had a, a wonderful liberal arts education where I 
you know, I took all the sciences. I had, you know, bioscience, uh, geophysics, um, hardcore physics, uh, and, you know, really felt like that added to my education. But I was a humanities major. Uh, I had a triple major in uh, philosophy, religion, and politics. Um, but having that well-rounded experience, well-rounded academic experience was really important to me. And I think uh, it makes you a better citizen and makes you a, a more well-rounded person. So any, you know, any sort of uh, narrow academic discipline has the danger of being too narrow. Um, but so long as, you know, people in the sciences, just like people in the humanities, uh, have had that wider experience, then hooray, I'm all for it. So, Jeff, let's talk about that humanity, because you do a lot of humanitarian missions and that as well as, and on a lot of board of directors for a lot of, uh, humanity aids and and that as well correct well yeah um i'm actually i'm only on three boards now which is the fewest i've ever been on uh, for a long time i was on usually from seven to ten different boards but okay. i've been kind of letting go uh of some of them and trying to be you know more focused and also have time for pickleball Right, because you got to get that last game in there. <laughs> That's right. Like, <laughs> I want to talk about making a difference. When you hear that phrase, Jeff, what what do you think of? Well, I think it you know is it, it's going back to giving back. Uh, I, I think it's very easy to just take from life. You know, take from your parents, take from your school, take from your community, take from your country. Um, you know, there's so much that's just given freely to us, you know, particularly if you're from um, middle or upper class family. I mean, you know, if you're poor and struggling from the very beginning, that's, uh, you know, it, it's it's a little bit more difficult, but still even then no matter what your circumstances are at some point you should be able assuming that you, you know you're not completely incapacitated uh you should be able to give back and uh there there's a, a lot of research that's shown that uh giving back acting charitably or philanthropically is very good for your mental health um and that's, you know, I think that's just part of being a well-rounded person. And I think the more you have, uh, the more you ought to give back, because that means the more you have, the more that's been given to you. So, um, yeah, that's that's the way I see it. I like how our conversations always go, because I always go into my next question or my, or my next comment. Uh, I want to talk about mental illness and wellness, uh, since you brought that up. and I. For men, speaking on a man's behalf, do you feel that there's enough services out there for mental health for men? Um, I I think there is if you can afford it. Oh. Um, like in my uh, neighborhood, which is called Broad Ripple in Indianapolis, we we have a whole lot of. Uh, counselors psychologists psychiatrists they're just you know have offices uh within this uh neighborhood of less than a hundred thousand people um and throughout my city indianapolis there's just like there are uh, grocery deserts there are uh medical and mental health deserts where it's not as accessible but um if you know if you have the means to pay for it or you have good insurance to pay for it at least um in the communities that i'm familiar with and that i've lived in it's there but the for somebody who doesn't have insurance coverage 
uh, and who can't afford it or who's not in the U.S., you know, not on Medicaid, Medicare, uh, if you've fallen between those cracks, then how are you going to get it? I if think that's something that has never been really been brought up, Jeff. Like when you said that, that was the first time I never even thought of funding. Like if you have the funds to get the help, uh, you know, some of us live in countries where it's covered by an OHIP or or we're put on waiting lists and stuff like that. But I I never ever thought of if you can afford to get the help. Um, that that puts another burner on to mental health and and reaching out to get services as well. Yeah, well, you know, that's the difference between one of the differences between U.S. and Canada, U.S. and U.K., U.S. and basically all of Western Europe uh, and much of the other, even much less developed countries that have what <clears throat> people here uh you know sort of derogatorily call socialized medicine um you know here we have really high quality medical care including mental health care if you have the right insurance or if you can afford it um but you know in the u.s right now another problem uh is i've seen statistics that indicate 50 percent of young people are suffering from depression and many of those young people are not getting any care for that depression uh, either because it's not recognized or if it is recognized it's stigmatized um, or they don't have access to it because they can't afford it their school doesn't have counselors or there it has counselors but they're overburdened um and so you know it's one thing when you've got you know a person here and there who's got uh mental health issues that need tending to and it's it's and they're not getting the care they need well that's a bad thing but when you've got you know mil literally millions of teenagers that have mental health issues and they're not getting the care they need that's you know that's a really troubling situation <clears throat> and the u.s isn't the only country that has that problem yeah um because even if you have a uh, nationalized uh, health care including mental health uh care uh you still have the problem of stigmatization recognition you know those those kind of things so uh yeah. and especially in the u.s you know we have these school shootings it seems like about every month if not more often than not and we all know that the shooters are very troubled i mean they're almost always young other troubled young people usually young people that either are going to or went to that school um yeah it's just you know you 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 want to think and i mean i guess i don't really know if it's true but i'm pretty positive that if that person that young person had had proper mental health care when needed it's unlikely that would have happened yeah I feel mental health is a lot of diagnoses are being being given out, but a lot of people don't understand the diagnosis. You know, you're you're being told, okay, you have depression, take this pill and do this and do that, change this, but they're not actually getting that conversation going where they talk about what causes depression. Is it genetic? Is it uh, your lifestyle? Is it the, your eating habits? You know, we're we're getting a lot of labels and a lot of names, but we're not getting understanding i find with mental health yeah i think that's a great point and also sometimes even the mental health uh care professionals can be very narrow in their approach and like okay yeah. you you fit this category you get this pill uh or you fit that category you get this talk therapy as opposed to a really holistic approach which you know would cover all those things you just mentioned diet environment genetics uh, 
you know, possible uh, drug therapy and just the whole environment, the whole person, I think really good mental health care is going to do that, take that a kind of approach. Yeah. I find mental health has increased immensely since people started talking about it. Uh, you know, when we had stuff in, 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 in the shadows, I found that there was less of it. Uh, now that it's out there and people are just saying, I have mental health, or, I live with mental illness. But then when you try to ask them if they understand why they're living with it or why they were diagnosed with that, they have no clue why they were diagnosed. Like myself, I was diagnosed with conversion disorder and I was like, what is that? Like, I've never heard of it. So I had to do the research myself and I'm just like, oh, okay, well, I have some of these symptoms. I have some of this, uh, you know, but if you don't do the research and you don't ask the questions, you just, you're labeled, right? You're just labeled with, oh, okay, I have de depression. I have BPD. I have uh multiple personalities, I have conversions, but we're not understanding these illnesses, right? So how can we better ourselves? You know, uh, and I think it all goes right back to education, like go back and educate ourselves, do the research. And, and it's almost like going back to your book, hitchhike to find the answers, right? Have that conversation. Because when you got in the car, you had a conversation with a person. And I think conversation brings back everything. It, it, it goes right back to having that conversation and asking those questions and saying, why are we going through this? Why do we have so much increase in this? Why do we have so much decrease in this? Because we're not having conversations. Yeah, and in our, in the US, the way our healthcare system works is Healthcare professionals, professionals are under so much pressure to see more and more patients, you know, get them in, move them, you know, the kind of a factory uh, assembly line approach to it, because that's what the insurance companies uh, want. And the di I, I, as a lawyer, I represented a number of doctors and uh, medical offices and you know, it just saw the change as insurance companies more and more took over health managing healthcare, uh, and so, so many doctors, um, older doctors who could get out got out because they just they hated it, and it's uh, you know the the financial side of it should has to be there. I mean, it's got to be paid for. So that should always be in the background. Yeah. You know, the first thing should be, what does this patient, this client need? Let's have a conversation and let's not feel like we have to rush it. Um, yeah. and, well, now, uh, now doctor's appointments are like 15 minutes. And if you don't get everything in 15 minutes, you got to make another appointment. And those appointments are usually three, four months down the road. Well, by that time, you've already healed yourself or you've already taken a, a cold medicine to get over the cold or the virus. Like, you know what I mean? Uh, we've rushing. I, I find today's world is just a big old rush, right? We're not taking the time to listen. We're not taking that time to pause and say, Oh, maybe we have something here. Uh, you know, um, I've been watching this series. I, I forget what the series is, but it's about vampires and zombies and all of that. And they're testing the blood all the time. And I feel like science has really just rushed too. Because they're being told, no, we just need an answer. Just give us an answer. It doesn't matter if it's ready. Just give it to us. Okay. So we're getting partial answers instead of full answers on the understanding of why things are happening the way they are today. Well, I know when I was practicing law, uh, if I didn't take the time to pay attention and really listen to my client to fully as you know as much as i was capable of to fully grasp their situation to grasp what the problem was which wasn't always you know necessarily right there obvious on on the surface uh i could miss something and could completely screw up a case uh and it's the same in medicine um yeah. i mean it's the same in a lot of different types of work that you have to be open and to take that holistic approach and when you have the financial pressures that don't allow you to do they just don't allow you the time you know that 15 minutes you know in some cases maybe that's enough but in a lot of cases it's not going to be enough 
And mm -hmm. it's just, it's just, it's bad. It's bad for everybody. It's bad for the practitioner. I mean, like I said, I represented doctors that just, you know, hated working under that system. And, uh, you know, I always thought being, I, I sort of wished I would have gone into medicine instead of law because uh, a doctor can do so many wonderful things. I mean, like I've helped put on medical clinics uh, over in Nepal, not practicing the medic, it was just organizing it. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, these doctors come over and do these medical missions and help people who don't have any medical care whatsoever. And, oh my God, what a wonderful thing to be able to do. Because, you know, what do you do with a law degree? You go over there and walk around with a piece of paper and say, well, you know, uh, if you need another piece of paper, I'll get you one. But uh, no, and so it's just, it's a shame when, uh, you know, you can see doctors practicing in an environment where they don't have that financial pressure because it's volunteer. Yeah. Uh, they're doing it on their own time uh, and on their own dime. And, um, you know, and see, and I've, you know, just seen how delighted doctors are that get to do that. Like just today, I was uh, at my Scientech club and had this wonderful chat with an 80 year old retired urologist who participates in this organization called PAX, P A X, it's physicians, something or other, I can't even remember now, but he's traveled all over Africa, uh, putting on uh, free medical clinics and educating um, young African doctors and bringing them back to the States and so forth. And just you know, what a great thing, what a gift to be able to do that. And so to, you know, to have that gift and then to have it just so stunted because of the financial pressure of an insurance company is just, it's a, it's terrible. It's a shame. Yeah. So Jeff, I want to go back to your book, the, the Hitchhiker's Big Adventure. So if you could say anything to any of the hitchhikers that are still hitchhiking in today's world, what would you say to them? Well, you know, now if, if I'm speaking the voice of my mom, it would be be careful. <laughs> uh, but try going back to that 18 year old uh, adventurer, um, I would say just, you know, be open, be open to the experience, but also be careful. Uh, you know, listen to your mom, be careful but don't let your mom be like the insurance company that stunts you into being too narrow. <laughs> I love that. You don't listen to your mom guys from where this was out there. Right. So Jeff, if you had any final words to give to anybody out there, what would your final message be to everybody? Well, I just, uh, what we've been saying, you know, live life like it's an adventure but make your life into a beautiful work of art and be responsible. Use your gifts to give back to the world that's given so much to you. So Jeff, how could we bring value back into life? Um, I think by doing exactly the things that we've been talking about, you know, live life like it's an adventure, create a beautiful life and be responsible in terms of how you you intentionally find ways to give back and to add value to your community because it will add value to your own life. So Jeff, do you have any plans of writing a new book? Um, my wife and I, for the first time ever, you know, we're both writers, we've both written about the same number of books, are collaborating on a long-term project, uh, since COVID started, we began a uh, custom of almost every weekend picking out a small town or an interesting site within our state of Indiana and going and visiting and taking a bunch of pictures, researching it, posting about it on Facebook, but then eventually turning this into a book about uh, all the small towns in Indiana 
and uh, what life is like in these towns, the history, and also how how they can survive and improve. Because so many of them, uh, you know, in this uh, rust belt, uh, you know, after the collapse of the auto and steel industry, which has come back to some extent, you know, so many of the towns in the Midwest and also in, you know, lower Canada, I know too, have suffered terribly. And some have really struggled back very successfully. Excuse me. And others are still really struggling. And sorry. And uh, you know, losing population. And we've come up with a few ideas on what they should do or can at least try. Yeah, I've been following so some of your journeys that. and some of your pictures. Yeah. Like you you give a lot of information as well when you're taking pictures of buildings and stuff like that. And I found it really interesting. You were in one part and I, I believe it was a sawmill or it was a factory of some sort and all the windows were busted open on it. You had given mm -hmm. lots of information on that one. I found that really interesting and that as well. Yeah. 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 So we try to, you know, portray uh, both towns that are, are struggling and, and, you know, failing and towns that have really succeeded and come back and, and what's the difference and how could the ones that are struggling, what could they do to make their town a more attractive place to live, to bring back people and to bring new people in? Yeah, I, what I really found interesting about it is the history that you're giving as well, of when the building was built, what 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 was running in that building, uh, you know, a lot of cool facts. So if anybody wanted to follow your adventures with these uh, pictures and updates, where can they follow you for that, Jeff? Well, I'm doing that on Facebook. So just my name, Jeff Raisley, on Facebook, um, you'll see the posts that uh, i've done and you'll see a new one just uh, about every week sometimes more than like this last weekend we uh visited uh two uh sort of sacred spaces sacred places in indiana uh, saint minred monastery and uh saint mary's immaculate conception monastery and so i focused on those two monasteries and also the little town nearby so I'm, i've split it into two different posts so jeff if anybody wanted to follow you where could they follow you um i have a website which is uh www and then my full name jeffrey raisley.com so that's there and then that'll have links to my books and uh, the two different foundations and also uh, for anybody that's interested in trekking or climbing in the Himalayas I'm still involved with an outfitter company over there I'm their U.S. representative so uh, yeah there's all that's on my website well it's been a real pleasure having you back it's three times it's three years and we always have some good conversations and some good talks together uh if anybody would like to see Jeff's three tea times, you can check out Miss Liz's YouTube channel. Go over there, subscribe, ring that little doorbell, and you can see those. Uh, Jeff was on on season three, season four, and now he's on season five. So you can check Jeff's three tea times out. Maybe make it a, 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 a what do you call that? Uh, watching a sequel, like yeah. a, a series. Jeff's series. We'll have Jeff's series. And there's other multiple guests that have been on tea time that have been on many times. So you can check out their tea times as well. Uh, if you'd like to know more about Miss Liz, check out Miss Liz's website at www.misslizestteatimes.com. I will be back on Thursday. Uh, Joel McKay, who was supposed to be on on the 3rd, he is feeling better. So he'll be back on Thursday and he'll be sharing his books. And it's called uh, It Came From The Trees. It's a horror fiction. So we're going to talk about that book. And then we're also going to talk with Gary W. Wait, wait for it. I hope I'm saying it right. And we're going to talk about his book as well with a little bit of humor and one, one, one humor, one language in a small classroom. So we'll be talking about that book as well. So you can check that out. Until then, just keep spilling your teas, keep being true to yourselves and make a difference by sharing real kindness and real strong tea. 
together one cup of tea at a time and we'll make a difference. And until then, thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for all listening. And I will be back on Thursday, same time, same place. And we'll spill two new teas with you guys all then. Until then, take care.